Hi, I'm Peter and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be a bit different from what I would normally upload, because I've recently had the great pleasure of interviewing the great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens, Gerald Dickens. Gerald is an extremely highly esteemed actor and has been performing various one-man show adaptations of Charles Dickens' works since 1993, and I found the conversation to be absolutely fascinating and thought that perhaps you would as well, so I've decided to upload it to YouTube. There will be timestamps for the different sections of the interview in the description, as well as a link to Gerald's website, which will detail his upcoming shows, as well as various aspects of his career, which you may be interested in under his biography section. Although, if you are looking for upcoming shows, which I would highly recommend, I wouldn't expect anything to be happening soon, given... Hmm, public health concerns. Regardless, and without further ado, I look forward to showing you an exclusive interview with the man himself, Gerald Dickens. So, um, first question I wanted to ask was specifically uh, to do with the Christmas Carol um, yep. thing that you, uh, you've done. Um, so, Christmas Carol has been adapted to be uh, in so many different ways, uh, from you know the Muppets version to Patrick Stewart version, I even found uh, a graphic novel uh, of it yeah. online. Yeah, uh, so I was just wondering, what what would you say about the story gives it so much accessibility uh, to different audiences? It's an incredible story. I, I mean, I've been performing it since 1993, and every year I do it, I find something new in it. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's such a simple story, but there are so many layers and so many depths, and I, I think. Part of it is it's sort of an everyman story in that we can all identify with every one of the main characters in the book. So we all have elements of, of Ebenezer Scrooge in us. We all have elements of Bob Cratchit in us. We all have elements of, of, of hopefully the, the three spirits spreading whatever they spread. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's good triumphing over evil. It's Star Wars. It's <laughs> any of those. And, and like all Dickens novels, it has rattling good characters. Um, yeah. you, know, you can't beat a good character. Um, it's an extraordinary book. I mean, it's never been out of print since it was published in, in 1843. It's never been out of print. Um, yeah. it, it, it has an incredibly lasting thing. And I think also because it's very theatrical in its, in its tone and Dickens loved theatre. He was an absolute frustrated actor. He wanted to be a professional actor. And when he wrote A Christmas Carol, he, he was walking through the night, sort of reciting passages to himself and, and having dialogue with himself and using mirrors to see facial expressions and what was coming back. So it sort of began life as a, as a performed piece, if you like. Yeah. And then when he got what he wanted, seeing it in the mirror, he went back and, and wrote it down. And he wrote it incredibly quickly. He had the idea at the beginning of October, and it was published um, second week of December of 1843. So he wrote it in six weeks, flat out. So I think because it had that sort of um, theatrical gestation, it transfers very easily into a theatrical performance or a, a movie performance or a, a graphic novel or whatever it is. It, it, it has a, um, a, a theatrical life of its own. Um, and the other reason is yeah. it's out of copyright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I always felt it's got quite a, uh, a timeless nature. Like when you look yeah. at other works from around that period, it's got at least some level of um, something which uh, something which grounds it in that time period, be yeah. it uh, uh, classism or um, the yeah. And, and a lot something. of the issues he was tackling are just as relevant today. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 we yeah. were still fighting the same issues. Um, the the huge poverty gap between between rich and poor, is, you know, is is, is just yeah, as much, exactly much more so. Yeah. Now than it was then. So yeah, I, I guess it resonates with us and maybe hits a guilt complex in us that, that we yeah. Have, you know, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um. So um. I, another thing I was going to say is. Uh, Dickens work in general from uh, Christmas Carol to Great Expectations, I'd say it's one of the Britain's greatest uh, cultural outputs from like rivaling stuff like James Bond, uh, Sherlock Holmes, that kind of thing. Uh, so, a James Bond mug here. I'm not... <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> Coincidence? My, my other favourite author, Ian Fleming. Yeah, anyway. Brilliant, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, uh, it's more of a personal question. How did you feel about uh, bringing that story to audiences who may never have experienced it? Before? Um, well, the, the first thing to say is I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I am performing Dickens to audiences, but I don't need to be to preserve his legacy. You know, he's going to do just fine whether I'm doing this or not. Um, so so, so it, it, it's not any cause I'm following or any particular vocation to keep Dickens' work alive. It's, it doesn't need it. Um, it's easier for me to look at it from the viewpoint of an actor rather than a family member. And as an actor, I got what material. I, what unbelievable material he, he, he gives me or anyone else who chooses to do this. It's extraordinary. Um, the other book you picked on there, Great Expectations, is it, just an unbelievably complex set of um, layers of, of, of characterization and, and psychological, um, what well, sort of mental health issues, actually, if, we, if we're talking in, yeah. in, in, in the parlance, you know, all the way through from Estella to Miss Havisham to, to Pip to Joe, all of them. So there's so much material there. Um, and an audience, a modern audience, just laps it up. Um, same as the previous answer, really, because, because it is still so relevant. So my performing it is, is just a treat for me as an actor. Um, it, it, it's quite an interesting thing I have to get over in my own mind, is, is that differential between a great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens and a working actor going to a theatre doing a job. And my, my my sort of um, the definition I come up with is is I'm, I'm very well aware that a lot of the marketing, a lot of the selling that the theatre do is because of my relationship with Charles Dickens. So a lot of the audience are coming in at the beginning of the evening for that reason. I need to send them away at the end of the evening, having had a really good entertaining evening, irrespective of of what my name is or anything else. So, yeah. so that, that's how I get around that sort of conundrum in my own mind. But you know, wherever I go, and especially in America, um, the, the the passion for Dickens and his work and his characters, and also the story of his life, are, are still just so engaging audiences that they they love it. And you know, the amount of times the BBC or whoever it is will will do another Dickens costume drama because the market's there for it. People love it. Yeah, um, it, it's it's incredible the the, the the grip he still has on his audience over 200 yeah. years after his birth. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it is quite remarkable. I uh, I got the opportunity to play Pip um, oh. as part of a uh, uh, young, um, is part of the Connections uh, National Youth Theatre um, thing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I still think to this day it's one of my favourite parts yeah. I've ever played. Cause it is Pip is an so amazing cool. role. Uh, it's Great Expectations, yeah. one of his later books, and it's much more complex in structure than some of his earlier ones and Pip's yeah. a great hero because he's thoroughly unlikable to most of it you know yeah. he's not this, this yeah. charming hero all the way through he's, the, the way he treats Joe and, and it's awful yeah you know, the, he's um, human it, and it's very human and that's exactly it that's exactly it but, um uh, a character of Scrooge um mm -hmm. uh, as I was with uh story of Christmas Carol in general um Scrooge has kind of become a staple of pop culture you know the grumpiness mm. the pessimism so what kind of creative process did you go through to create the character of Scrooge without uh without falling into that caricature no. uh, well yeah <laughs> it's an interesting point you put there actually he has become this this icon of grumpiness and poor bloke he goes through that whole story he goes through all of that and it's still all we remember yeah. <laughs> it's him being mean what, what was the point <laughs> <laughs> scrooge is interesting and and you, you sort of have to work behind what we're told if you like um, we, we told his old, and um, that, that whole opening description of him was squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as it, it, it's, it's all very harsh, and, and the way he treats everybody on Christmas Eve, you know, we get a very clear picture of who he is. More importantly than that is, is where his office is. And we're told it's right behind the Bank of England. It, it, it's on... Um, it, it, it's by the stock exchange. It's right there in the heart of the city. So straight away, 
we know that he is a respectable businessman. He's not some little backstreet money lender who, who's desperate to to, to 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 rob from everybody. He is a respectable businessman. He does business all the way through the book. In in, in a lot of the um, sequences for the ghosts, he, he sees people who he is um, in in daily contact with, and, and he works with them. So I think that's a really important thing to remember. He, he's not dishevelled. He's not pathetic. He's he's not um, a villain. He's not a crook by any sense. Um, he, he says to the charity collector who comes collecting on Christmas Eve, you know, in effect, he says, I pay my taxes. What, why do I need to give more to help the poor? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing my bit. Um, it's a fair enough question. Um, yeah. So, so all of that shapes who, who he is. He, he, he's a respectable businessman. Um, and, and that's sort of where I was come back to. That's what I have to remember. Yes, he is hard and he's harsh and he's vicious and he's mean, but he's never villainous. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the idea of A Christmas Carol came from another short story that Dickens had written a few years before as part of the Pickwick Papers. Um, that there's a little scene where a group of people are sat around a fire and somebody says, ah, let me tell you a story. And whenever a character does that in Dickens, you know he was running out of ideas to finish that month's instalment. So <laughs> yeah. Tell you a story. Um, and the story is of a grave digger called Gabriel Grubb. And the grave digger loves the fact he's digging a grave on Christmas Eve because that gives him absolute joy. And on his way up, a carol singer comes the other way and he hits him with his spade and he knocks him to the ground. And he's, horrible he's nasty he's vicious and he, he sets down to rest having dug the grave and he's swigging the gin back and suddenly this supernatural goblin appears from from beneath the ground and pulls him down into a subterranean cabin where he's shown scenes of of life and kindness and love and loss and all the themes that come into a christmas carol and when he wakes the next morning lying back in the graveyard covered with frost, the empty bottle of gin by him. He, he, he leaves because he can't bear to face the community anymore. And when he comes back 10 years later or whatever it is, he's, he's, he's a changed person. Yeah. So Dickens had sort of played with the idea before, but he'd made the, the protagonist villainous and vicious and nasty and violent. And when he came to do that with the Christmas Carol, he didn't. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. So so within Scrooge, there there, there is a humanity and a sense of community and a sense of love and a sense of loss. Um, it's pretty well hidden at the beginning, but it, 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 it's all there. The other thing I think, which I've always tried to do with it, is to make his, his reformation begin at the very first scene that he is shown by the ghost of Christmas past. You see so many productions where Scrooge is evil and nasty and horrible, and then the ghost comes and he's evil and nasty and horrible to them, and then the next ghost comes and he's evil, nasty and horrible, and then the last ghost comes and he's terrified and suddenly he's all right again. It doesn't work. He has to be shown every single thing that the ghosts show him, and they all have to hit the mark. So the very first scene, they go back to his, his childhood village and his school, and the ghost shows him an image of himself in the schoolroom alone. All he's got is his books. He's reading his books, but all the other children have gone home. They've been taken home by the family. He's been left there, abandoned. Yeah. And as Scrooge looks at him, he remembers the little boy that came carol singing the night before. And he says, oh, I wish, I wish I could have given him a little something, but it's too late now. So right at the very start, he's, he's, he's on the journey. He's thinking about it. And I think that's really yeah. important as well. Um, is, is is making that that progression of change real? Yeah, and, and I, to I, I, that, everything's got to be there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to hear because that when I watched your uh, film with it, I actually really noticed that uh, it stood out. Um, it's something Probably that because I had bugles and flags waving. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> no, no, it was really really good. I I think the, the reason I picked up on it, it, part of it may well be that as I've uh, grown up. I've uh, become more analytical, but um, mm -hmm. something which I noticed was that in that first scene with the um, with uh, Scrooge's schoolboy, mm -hmm. I wish I'd given uh, Carol sing something. Mm -hmm. It goes from that. To, uh, oh, I wish I'd given something, but what can you do? It's a bit like mm -hmm. that. 
So at the end, he tracks down Bob Cratchit at his house and uh, increases his pay. And I think even yeah. that kind of shows your progression from throughout almost. Well, and then the other thing was well, when he's calling out the window for the little boy to go and get the the, the turkey, and 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 he, he gives him yeah. he gives him money. I, I don't know if it is the case, but I like to think it's the same boy. Yeah, yeah. I and, like and, and when Scrooge says, "Here, have half a crown, or whatever it is," yeah, that's the result of, of, of that that first memory in the um, yeah in, in this. I don't know if that is true or not. Again, over the years, I've I've made so many little connections, which may or may not be there. May may not have been in Dickens's mind when he wrote it. I don't know, but but they they were. Yeah, um, yeah. Nice to, to to tie up those little bits. Did you see the Christmas Carol the BBC did last year? I don't think so. Really, I don't recall really it. Really dark and yeah. and vicious. It, it was incredible actually, but there were some very interesting themes in it. Um, yeah, I'll it, have to give it a watch. Didn't, yeah, didn't have to divide opinion uh, among dear old grumpy Dickensians. Really. <laughs> choking on their cravats and, and yeah um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was really interesting there were a lot of very interesting themes in that yeah no yeah sounds i'll, I'll have to give it a watch don't put that on the list <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um where in in terms of moving on to like the creating process of mm-hmm. creating a one-man show mm-hmm. how do you how do you even begin putting together a one-man show it's like I, i've i've I don't even know how I'd start if uh, someone asked me to do it. Um, well, the, the, the truth of the matter is I, I, I never really planned to do it. Um, <laughs> it. It sort of happened rather by accident, but a very happy accident for me. Um, in 1993, I was asked to do a reading of A Christmas Carol in the same way that Charles Dickens had gone on tour doing readings um, and to recreate one of his performances because 1993 was 150 years of Christmas Carol being written and there was lots of publicity about at the time and a a lady who represented a charity approached me and said this is a great idea for raising funds for the charity to recreate one of those readings and um um and, 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 and try and get publicity that way and I really didn't want to do it um, up to that point, I'd, I'd shied away very much from having anything to do with with Dickens. We, we, we did one production back at Trinity in Tunbridge Wells of, of A Christmas Carol a few years before, um, but that was the only thing I'd ever done. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd completely distanced myself from it as an actor, which meant I wasn't doing anything. Um, so I, I sort of reluctantly agreed to do this reading. Um as it was for charity. It was only ever going to be a one-off. And I sort of thought, I can't do a Victorian reading. It's going to be dull and tedious and boring. And what I need to do is kind of pep it up, is, is, is bring it rather into the 20th century. So I, I started looking at the, the script of the reading and, and working out voices. It had to be a vocal piece. And I wanted to really accentuate the voices. So that first description of Scrooge, squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, you, 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 you've you got to Scrooge before you're at the end of the sentence. You can't help it. You're him. So everything else goes away from that. Everything else has to be opposite to Scrooge. So a, a conversation can be clearly defined um, to an audience's mind. So I started looking for opposites. So, so Cratchit, whereas Scrooge was very harsh and all his movements were bad, uh, you'll be here next morning. <laughs> Cratchit had to be very soft and gentle and, and his movements were sort of a little, he was always twitching and and, go on, and, you know, and I wanted to give him a very soft accent. Now, originally I was going to make him Welsh, um, <laughs> lovely lyrical sweet, but then, then I discovered I couldn't do Welsh, so <laughs> I didn't make him Welsh. <laughs> um, but he sort of had this Cornish lilt, it was quite gentle and, and then, oh, if, 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 if it's quite possible, I, I, if I could have to do all day tomorrow. And, and, and he never quite gets to the end of a sentence, you know, where Scrooge is, is harsh and cuts his sentences off. And it, it just kind of worked that way. And doing a reading, you've got a book in your hand. So you've only got one hand free to do anything with. So, so then I, I started wanting to use a lot of gestures and movements of, of this hand to, 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 to create scene and, and all the ghosts have their own way of pointing and, yeah. and, and doing things. So, so that's how I kind of built that up. And I was so proud of myself. I thought, God, this is good. I am so talented. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I purposefully not gone back and looked at, at how Dickens had done it. 
I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make it my show, very much my show. Um, I used his edit, his script, which my, my my dad sort of steered me towards. But as as far as learning what he had done, I, I ignored it completely. I yes. just did my own show. So I got to got to the first performance, and I did the show and all the movements. And it was fantastic, and the audience loved it. And I seem to remember it was candlelit. So the the the, the, the audience were sat at tables like cabaret style tables, and they had little candles in the middle, so you could just see people's faces. And there was one table, and I was doing the whole thing and doing it. And I suddenly saw a, a gentleman sort of beckon to his his table mate, and and he grabbed a pencil and wrote something down. And I thought, God, it's amazing! I've, I've got him so hooked. He doesn't want to break the atmosphere by by, by talking, you know. So he's writing notes, and 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 his his friend read the note and read it and nodded and wrote a note back, and they passed it. And they had this conversation by notes because they didn't want to break this yeah. unbelievable atmosphere I created. And and the show finished, and Everybody clapped and they all went home. And I thought, right, I've got to go and read those notes now. So I ran up to the table. What it said was, is he going to do the whole bloody book? <laughs> <laughs> the reply was, God, I hope not. <laughs> Which brought me plummeting right back to the ground. Anyway, um, <laughs> having done that, and, and most people seem to like it, I then went back and researched how Dickens had done. And what I discovered was I hadn't reinvented anything. He had done it exactly that way with lots of drama and massive vocal range and very physical in his in his performance. So there is me thinking I was reinventing this whole art form. Not at all. Yeah. I done before. I, what I was doing was absolutely recreating what Dickens had done. So the show stayed like that for a while, a couple of years as a reading. Um, and then I was in America. I was, I was doing in America. And one afternoon I had two two performances in different venues. One was in a little hotel in Southern Tennessee. And then the next one was going to be in a library in Alabama. And there was about three hours drive between them. So we had very little time. I finished the first show. God bless us, everyone. Thank you very much. I've got a rush. Got to go. We stayed in costume, got into a car, drove off towards Alabama, got lost. We were running a bit late and eventually arrived at the library. And the audience were all sat there waiting for me to start. Luckily, I was still in costume, which was fantastic. Yeah. I ran in and said, really sorry, so we've got a bit lost. You know, and there we go. Ready, here we go. Um, and at that point, I realised I'd left my reading book three hours up the road. You know, <laughs> I had no time to do anything. And the audience was sat there looking at me, and I was standing there looking at them. I think, oh. I thought, I've been doing this for two years. I know it begins Marley was dead to begin with. I know it ends, God bless us, everyone. I know there are four ghosts in the middle of it. I might be able to get away with this. I might be able to. <laughs> and if anyone complains I'm not doing the proper text, I'll just say it's a very little known early draft of the book that only the Dickens family has ever seen. You know, I can get, can get away with murder in America for that. <laughs> so I began. I said Marley was dead to begin with. No, nope, no, nope, can't think of the next line. Oh, no, I can. No doubt, whatever. And I suddenly realized I knew the whole script. I'd never sat down to learn it, but I knew it. Yeah. It just sort of come in by osmosis sort of thing. So I started carrying on. And, and then as I was performing, I thought, what's the point of me standing at this, this lectern? Because I haven't got a book. I'm not looking at anything. Why, why not use what I've got around me? And there's a chair over there. I can use that. That can be Scrooge's sort of office chair, and it can turn into his – and there's a little stool over here. That's great. That can be Bob Cratchit's stool in the office and can become Tiny Tim's bed, uh, the fireside chair. In the, great. And so, so I'm suddenly working on two levels. Yeah. One level is 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 going through the script as I've been doing it for the last two years. And the other one is thinking, ah, oh, in a minute, I'm going to need to be over there. How am I going to move that to there? And yeah. so, so, I'm, so I'm almost looking down at myself as I'm performing in, in a completely practical frame of mind. So the whole show was an improvisation on that that evening, born out of sheer panic. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and, and And it really worked. And, and that's one of the reasons when I still do it now, it stayed so simply because it doesn't need anything else. It's got all the description. It's got all the character. And as soon as you have a set, you're stuck in it. And the point about A Christmas Carol is it never gets stuck anywhere. It's always somewhere else. It's always going um, either in physical scene or, or, or in tone or emotion or everything else. So, so, so 
I performed this whole thing and I got to the end. God bless us, everyone. Everybody clapped and I thought, well, I've, I've got away with that one. And a little old lady came up to me afterwards and said, Mr. Dickens, that was remarkable. We we, we, we we were expecting you to do a reading. We didn't expect a show like that. And, and I said, well, that's a coincidence because so did I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then she said, I'll never forget it. She said, and to do all that with your medical condition was truly inspiring. What? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Said, no, 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 no. I, I understand. Maybe you don't want to talk about it, but but I'm a nurse, and uh, you know, I, I could see it. So um, I just want to know. It, it's impressive. I said, what are you talking about? Absolutely fine. What had happened was because I was doing the whole performance on automatic pilot. All my gestures and this hand doing this were just happening like they always had. My <laughs> left side was completely immobile. I wasn't doing a thing. She thought I had this terrible stroke and had complete paralysis on the left side of my body while my right hand was doing all the work. <laughs> so, so, so from that point, I then had to kind of go back to the performance and, and teach my, my left yeah. hand to, to, to catch up, to join in. Um, and that's how that show started. It, it, it just evolved on that night out of, out of sheer panic. And it was the best thing ever. And then as I carried on doing it over the years, the, the, the idea of doing a one-man performance where you are absolutely in control of everything, you are manip if, if it's going well, you're manipulating the audience and taking them into that place and another place and, and making them laugh when you want to and then suddenly making them cry when you want to. It's such an amazing feeling. And nowadays, I'm absolutely hopeless if I'm working with anybody else or a cast. I'm just so <laughs> selfish as an actor because I, I just want to do it all myself. And, you know, you used to crush people down. So, so I'm, I'm rather stuck with one man. Yeah. Nobody else would uh, I mean, so You, you <laughs> couldn't make up a story like that, could you? You couldn't make it up. No. <laughs> Real. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, I think you've kind of uh, answered this question a little bit. I was uh, going to ask, when, when devising the different performances that you now do, um, were there many opportunities to get um, others' uh, feedback and criticism as as though uh, a, a direct a director would I, uh, I I don't use a director and I probably should do um, my wife is very good at not becoming involved in the creative process in the beginning but when when she's seen a show she would just very gently <laughs> very gently sort of say well, that didn't quite work or, or maybe try that or I was surprised we didn't do that or, or whatever it is and 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 then we go through a process of that and I've got a very good feeling now as to as to what is working and what isn't you know I, I will have a good idea at the computer I think when I'm writing but you get onto stage and suddenly no nah, it's too complicated or it just doesn't work so yeah. we ditch that um I, I did a show in uh, America in, in Minneapolis five or six years ago now which wasn't one of my shows it, it, it was written by a playwright over there it was produced by a, a absolute dickens fan and it was based on a little book dickens wrote for his children called the life of our lord which was to teach them about the gospels so so right. the, the producer was a, a very devout christian and a very devout dickens lover so he, he, he couldn't believe he discovered this book it's the best thing that ever happened to him and he set up the performance as a proper performance with with scriptwriter and a director and that was one of the first times I'd worked on a whole production of the director for a long long time and it was a really really interesting experience it was fascinating to to be part of a team again that's the thing I miss doing the one-man show is you, you yeah you know that teamwork we used to have it at, at, back in Tunbridge Wells back in Kent you, you know you, you you you're creating a show from nothing and everybody's involved in it and yeah you that's actually things. one of the other questions I was going to ask how does the one-man show compare to a uh, ensemble piece yeah, it, positive and negative. Um, I, I, I love being on stage on my own. And, and, and as I said earlier, just, just being able to control whatever's going on. And, and if I want to put a slightly different tone on an evening's performance, I can without worrying yeah. how it's going to affect anyone else. You know, I, I can. Because you find an audience, especially American audience, is funny, are, are sort of living organisms and and sometimes they love 
the comedy or the humor or whatever it is. Sometimes they love the pathos. Sometimes they love the drama. And you need to tap into that quite early on. You need to get that and and, and then gently steer steer a production in a in a certain direction um, for that particular audience. So that's that's the side of it I absolutely love. Um, being, being able to do that. I, I do miss the camaraderie and, and I mean, my cast parties are the most miserable things out. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I do miss all that. And, and, and occasionally when we, when we get those old pictures coming up on Facebook of, of our days back at Trinity, you think, ah, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> It'd be fun to do again. Bro. So, um, yeah, um, I saw on your website uh, for I think it's just for the Christmas Carol ones. You did mm-hmm. off performances with uh, piano accompaniment. No. Yeah, we haven't done that for a while. My my, my wife's a, a classical pianist, um, right. so so we 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 played up and we've done a few few shows together, collaborations. Bro, I was I was uh, I only mentioned it because I was going to ask. Um, do they differ much from your one man shows? Because I'd imagine a little bit um, music, a, a, a little bit. Um, we, we we don't do them that often actually. Um, I, I I I suppose the performance has to be a little more formal because we 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 have to know exactly where where the music's coming in and and how it's coming in and the timing of it and, and that sort of thing. But um, actually, one one of the most successful performances we did together was not of a Christmas Carol. It's it's a a piece called Kinderscene, and which was written by Robert Schumann, which is thirteen short pieces of music all reflecting um aspects of childhood and i was able to to dovetail that with with readings and performances of childhood from dickens because dickens loved using children um as protagonists in his books yeah. and that worked really sweetly that that's one of our, our nicest performances and and i think it's because we created it as as a piano um vocal performance together whereas christmas carol is kind of like well here's the show how can we fit music yeah. into the it, it, it's not a natural creative process we went through whereas whereas kinder Sane and was um and and that that's the most successful one we do together i think bro lovely um so um yeah uh last question um if you could offer one piece of uh, advice to someone who was looking to uh branch out and put on a one-man show what, what would what would it be <laughs> do, do, do it I say. <laughs> um, it, it's a very obvious answer but you're on your own so if yeah. anything goes wrong it's just you yeah <laughs> it's no one to help you um so preparation is absolutely everything you have to know your text inside out upside down absolutely and because of that, I, I tend not to have a lot of tech stuff in my my shows because that's just another layer that can go wrong that I'm out of control of. Yeah. Um, unless I was traveling with a whole team of technicians who know the show and have done it a million times and it's all programmed into a, a, a laptop, that would be fine. But when you're going to a theater and, and the first time you met the tech guys that afternoon when you turned up and, you know, you've no idea yeah. how good he is or how much is concentrating on the script or whatever else it leaves you very very exposed so so being a one-man performer is just having as much under your own control as possible keep it simple and know know your your text it goes back to um to dear old Huntley's school I was in a show yeah um I was in a show of um the uh Crack what was it called? Um, it was a Hans Anderson, uh, the Tinderbox, Tinderbox, Hans Anderson. Show. And I was playing a king. And I was an arrogant little sub when it came to performing at Huntley's. And I, I, I won the acting cut for sort of how many years on the trot because nobody knew they even had an acting cut. They'd forgotten about it. And I was the only person that did any acting. So anyway, I, I was so cocky. And I was playing the king, which was a perfect role for me. I <laughs> Pomp. Anyway, I was in the stage and somebody else had gone off stage and I was on stage all by myself and I forgot my line. And I had no idea what to say. So I sort of acted all king-like and and we had a prompter and the prompter sort of whispered the line, but I couldn't hear it. I was the other side of the stage and she whispered it really, really quietly. 
I thought, well, I didn't get that. So I, I sort of regally moved across the stage to walk the side where she was, and she whispered the line again. I still couldn't hear it. <laughs> Louder! I sort of out of the corner of my mouth. So she then shouted the line, the line at the top of her voice, and the line was, "I am lost for words." So from the wings comes this line, "I'm lost for words." Of course, everybody in the audience just burst out laughing, and I just went. <laughs> I felt that big and I vowed never ever to feel that big again because it was the worst experience of my life and it still haunts me it's still my motivation if I'm working on a new script to get it learned and learned and learned again and learn it backwards and learn it sideways and learn it diagonally and learn it every way you can because that moment in the Huntley School Hall <laughs> just torments me to this moment it really yeah. does I am lost for words and everybody laughs. Um, yeah, so so if you're doing a one-man show, be prepared. That's 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 the advice. Brilliant, great. Well, really long answers to good questions. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, I mean, it it makes me seem really bad because it seems like that's all I've got for you. It's just that you've answered all my questions <laughs> through <laughs> other ones. So yeah, um, that's Simon, that's good good interview, Peter. I think. Yeah. yeah. Real, thank, thank you, thank you so much for. Through coming on as well i really really, really fun. sorry i've been looking at you at all i've been looking straight to my camera all the time so it's fine <laughs> um no you're really fun and and it, it's always good to talk it talk it through and um it was, I, it's well, absolutely fascinating it's yeah. lovely hearing, hearing about the process of it uh, eight years before i was and at that time there was an um, an amazing teacher there who loved theater and they did some incredible productions they did Macbeth on that stage and they did um journey's end and and some other incredible things and at that time and i assume that's where all, all that technical stuff came from yeah it was a really strong group and then he left and, and nobody else really cared yeah so I, I, up I, again in, in in our time um because you you left hunt is i think round about eight, the time eight. that i that i started so there's probably some, some, we didn't know each other in school it was only uh, no. in in DCW, DCW. that we knew I start. I think I left in 80, 81 or eighty two. Yeah, which is when I arrived. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. But yes, yeah, so the, the, the memories of um, Trinity as well. It's just yeah. a place I always loved. I just loved the ambience of that place. Um, yeah. And no, I need to take my show back there sometime. I need to get. I know, I'd like to. I love Trinity. Hello again. It's me. Whilst editing this. So, at this point we lost Gerald due to a truly ghastly internet connection, and so unfortunately I didn't get the chance to give credit or shout him out during the interview. So, I'm going to do that now. First of all, thanks so much to Gerald for taking part in this interview. It was an absolutely incredible experience to talk to someone so experienced in a fairly niche part of one theatre, and I hope you found it just as interesting as I did. There will be a link to Gerald's website in the description detailing upcoming shows, as well as a biography explaining his work and various other things relating to him. There is also a short film adaptation of Gerald's one-man show which I would highly recommend purchasing if you can't see him live on stage. It's a faithful recreation of his stage performances, but can be watched from the comfort of your sofa, which is always, always a plus. Also, thank you so much to Dr. Craig Barlow for organising and hosting this interview, as well as introducing me to the main man himself. Dr. Barlow is a criminologist and co-developer of SIPS, a model for safeguarding vulnerable children and adults, as well as managing past offenders. He is one of the leading experts in combating the exploitation of vulnerable people and is someone you should definitely familiarise yourself with if you have any interest in modern organised crime. Combating it, not, you know, doing it. There is also a link to his website in the description of this video as well. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content relating to film, TV, theatre and media in general, please consider subscribing to the channel. I make videos of questionable quality and like to pretend I'm a lot smarter than I am. Please feel free to add a comment with your feedback and criticism of this video. I'm a very small channel who is always open to critique. And finally, thanks for watching. See you around.